Hi, everyone. I got a chance to read Leadership for Culturally and Linguistically Responsive Schools by Martin Scanlon and Francesca Lopez. In our last session, Dr. Santi Bañez asked us to look into our linguistic identity. In other words, our interaction with language. Scanlon and Lopez reinforced that it's important to reflect on our own experiences and identity as students in order to prepare ourselves as leaders in transforming schools to effectively educate culturally and linguistically diverse students. So this is me. I was a culturally and linguistically diverse student in Azusa Unified School District. As I mentioned before, my parents were immigrants from Mexico. My first language was Spanish. My parents did not want me to be in a bilingual education program because they wanted to make sure I learned English. I struggled most of my elementary career until I reached about fifth grade, and then everything seemed to make perfect sense. Now I know that it takes about five to seven years for someone to master a second language. And my parents always reinforced Spanish at home by reading to me and asking me to read to them in Spanish as well. At one point of my life, I knew that I was being tracked not only by, for my academics, but also for my language. At middle school, we had such a large population that they divided us into two sections. One was section one versus section two, but then I later found out that it was really the bilingual section and the English only section. At first I didn't mind because I was put in the ESL section or the English um, as a second language and I seemed to relate to most of the students so I was okay with that. But later on they realized they misplaced me and they placed me in the English only which we also called as the coconuts. Brown on the outside but white on the inside. 90% of our population at the time was from Mexican descent. Later on in high school, I was really proud to know two languages really well, and I knew that ultimately it would help me for my college career. I now would like you to actually pause the slideshow and take a moment to reflect on your own experience as a student in elementary middle school, and high school with regards to language. All aboard! You're about to take a journey. Scanlon and Lopez invite us on an expedition to explore strategies and methods that will better serve our culturally and linguistically diverse students. They compare it to a sailing expedition. On a sailing expedition, one must attend to many conditions, which way the wind will blow, which direction one seeks, what barriers lie ahead. Factors such as these affect how one will trim the sails and move the tiller. One must attend to the boat's conditions as well. What is working? What is failing? When sailing, some conditions can be controlled, but others may not be controlled. As the saying goes, a sailor cannot change the wind, but can adjust the sails. There isn't one single route for a boat to take, to move ahead on the journey. But all the routes are not equally desirable or effective. Some are risky. Others might be safe, but, be safe, but rather slow. To navigate most effectively, the one at the helm needs to discern these complex conditions and chart an optimal course. This individual at the helm is a leader, and Scanlon and Lopez are trying to tell us that it's leadership that drives an organization to be mobilized. So we have a big task at hand as leaders. Scanlon and Lopez define culturally and linguistically diverse students as students who grew up in families with a variety of languages. 
these students tend to have an immigration history to the United States and continuity or interruption in schooling to literacy in their native tongue. These students are also known as English learners, English language learners, and limited English proficient. Scanlon and Lopez do point out that these terms are very subtractive as if the students were deficient in something. These types of terms ignore the richness in knowledge that these students bring to the table. It is important to note that we live in a very linguistically diverse world. There are over 200 living languages. One in five current students are living in homes in which a language other than English is spoken. Yet our school systems rarely foster bilingualism. Linguistic diversity over time has altered from being a problem to a right and to a resource. This is all dependent on the language ideology of the time, which according to Scanlon and Lopez is constructed and sustained by the values of society which include such things as economy, the media, and government, as well as social structures. The language ideology of schools are affirmed, whether they're going to be monolingual or bilingual, by the policies and practices of the time. Even though we have such a multilingual country, we have a dominant monolingual school system. Keeping in line with Scanlon and Lopez's metaphor of a sailing expedition, examining the history of our nation's language ideology is like looking at the atlas. It's important to know the layout so we can move forward with ease. Therefore, we need to know the past views of our country's language ideology in order to maneuver successfully in the present and the future of our linguistically diverse students. Scanlon and Lopez divide its history into three sections. The permissive period, the restrictive period, and the modern period. In the permissive period, it takes place between the 18th and 19th century. This is known as colonial America. We are a nation of immigrants. With all the various individuals that came and had various dialects, they constructed bilingual schools that taught children English, the three R's, and maintain their native dialect. Scanlon and Lopez also note that during this time, there were schools that were subtractive, that only focused on English and did not maintain the native dialect. It was an era of tolerance towards the variety of tongues spoken within communities. However, in the restrictive period, which is the late 1800s to mid 20th century, schools shifted to being more monolingual because of the new restrictions on immigration. Most foreigners that were allowed into the country were those that were more likely to fit in. This was driven by attitudes towards Indian populations, anti-German campaigns, anti-Catholic bigotry, and geopolitical influences due to World War I and II. Bilingualism 
became a threat to national security. 34 states banned instruction in any other language other than English. Bilingualism was seen as a handicap by various psychometric tests. English became part of the American identity and a luxury by middle and upper class U.S. citizens. There was a lot of pressure to assimilate during this time. This left the culturally and linguistically diverse students in a sink or swim method of instruction in schools. In the modern era, which took place between the mid 20th and early 21st century, this time and place became both restrictive and permissive. According to Scanlon and Lopez, UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, declared that the mother tongue of a child was the best medium to teach a child. In such areas of the Supreme Court, cases like Mayer v. Nebraska, Lau v. Nichols, Castaneda v. Picard fought English-only curriculum because it went against the 14th Amendment. This gave growth to bilingual education again. In the Bilingual Education Act of 1968, also the title Title VII of the Elementary and Secondary Act, it protected the rights of CLD students. This was built on the shoulders of the Brown versus Board of Education. It became a civil rights issue. This replaced the sink or swim approaches and gave a greater focus to sound pedagogy and culturally relevant strategies in school. This gave a promising future to the ideals of bilingual education. However, in this era, there still existed English-only movements. In the No Child Left Behind, it repealed the Bilingual Act therefore removing all references to bilingualism and biliteracy in schools. This also removed the support of native language instruction, therefore making the school systems once again monolingual. This obligated schools to increase English proficiency during this era, there were also propositions like California's 227, Arizona's 203, and Massachusetts 2, which demanded that schools have an English-only instruction, therefore denouncing bilingual education. Interestingly enough, though, these propositions still left the option of English-only students to acquire a second language, which sent a very mixed message. Scanlon and Lopez point out that we continue to have a big tug of war. We are linguistically disjointed. Those that advocate for multilingualism, for example, Utah proposes that 100 dual language bilingual schools be placed in their state by 2015. Now, this is a Republican state, 
and those um, that advocate in monolingualism um, sometimes say that most people are conservative Republicans, yet Utah is a Republican state. Multilingualism is usually associated to more of a li liberal Democrats, yet California and Massachusetts um, passed anti-bilingual policies. Multilingualism advocates that students will increase academically and cognitively and um, knowing various languages has social benefits and that it also helps in the global economy. Whereas monolingualism really proposes for English-only policies, yet in various um, studies and data analysis uh, from the propositions of California, Arizona, and Massachusetts, which were about a 7 to 11 year span, demonstrated um, inconclusive evidence. In other words, English-only instruction did not advance CLD students in their English nor in subject matter content. Monolingualism argues that um, other languages than English are a threat to national security. Um, 31 states want English as the official language, especially when it comes to government affairs. And um, really, they have this fear that it will cause social division. So now that we have our atlas down, we now need our GPS to navigate us, um, which Scanlon and Lopez refer to as the theory of action. These are a sets of ideas that guide how we choose to act. They go into this idea of what we would like to do versus what we actually do, and they explain that it's best to have these concepts as close together as possible. So in all of this, it really is school leaders create the learning architecture for successfully educating CLD students. Scanlon and Lopez make it a point to divide this theory in action in this idea of school leadership, the learning architecture, and successfully educating CLD students. Leadership is the drive of organizational learning. It is collective. It requires many individuals in a school community. Effective school leadership articulates ambition, expectations for teaching and learning. We as leaders promote social justice in which we are advocates for equity. Not just within the walls of school, but also to our communities and families. As leaders, we need to examine how the CLD students are being marginalized in schools. We need to establish goals that will address and eliminate this marginalization of these students so that they can be successful. All of this is done by promoting their social cultural integration, cultivating their language proficiency, and ensuring academic achievement. This will allow them to be successful. In this idea of learning architecture, 
Scanlon and Lopez define architecture as the art and discipline of planning and creating complex, carefully designed objects or systems. In this context, it is used to discuss design features, the process and the product of designing for learning. So in other words, making sure specifically that you're creating um, strategies to promote social culture integration, cultivating language proficiency, and ensuring academic achievement for CLD students. So leaders, this is your mission if you choose to accept it. How will you promote social culture integration, cultivate language proficiency, and support academic achievement? So here are the discussion questions for this reading. Um, you can choose um, one or two. You don't have to do them all. Um, I would like to see a more responsive, uh, more responses for the culturally responsive leadership with regards to how can leaders promote cultural um, integration, cultivate language proficiency, and ensure academic achievement for CLD students being very specific as to what um, you would do in schools um, to do that. But I also have other questions about this idea of um, linguistic identity. How will your experience as a student help in leading schools to effectively educate CLD students in the idea of history and language ideology? Um, name a time in your life when language was a right or seen as a resource or maybe even seen as a problem. Another question that you can um, look at is linguistic diversity. What are your views on English language um, and languages other than English and their role in the school system? Your belief in that. Um, another question with regards to bilingualism um, why has the United States maintained a monolingual school system in a multi multilingual country? Your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you also for listening.